Tonight, we need to discuss truth. We're revisiting a topic that we've discussed before, but the time is such that we can uh, review this again to refresh ourselves of what kind of trouble we are really in in the world. My goal here is to try to help you understand what's really going on. Honestly, this is probably one of the most important talks I've ever given. And that's why I'm giving it again. It really is a fundamental, foundational talk. Maybe it's not arranged as well as it could be, but it is a very important talk. Um, it covers just about all the bases, everything you need to know as to really why what is happening to us is happening. Maybe not the causes of the persons causing it, but what are the philosophical foundations for why we're having these strange things going on today? So let's go back to when our Lord was in his passion. So once upon a time, the procurator of Judea, Pontius Pilate, said to Christ, our Lord, what is truth? With man's fallen nature comes a certain duplicity. When dealing with this duplicity over a long period of time, and especially in someone of position of power like Pilate was, it seems to come out more than ever, this duplicity, one can easily start to wonder what truth really is. We're so used to dealing with lies and duplicity, you start to wonder, truth, what's that? How many times have we been left wondering what to believe or who to believe? One can see how someone like Pilate might despair, exclaiming, Truth? What is truth? So we have lots of double speak today. We have lots of double speak today. Lots of political correctness. Truth is important. Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. For this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate saith to him, What is truth? This is a very powerful phrase in the Bible. For this I was born. For this we were born too, to hear the truth and to love the truth to give testimony to the truth. For this we were born. Once again, this is a very fundamental concept, very fundamental presentation on truth tonight. Okay, essential mark of all truth is conformity. So today, in this lecture, I hope to present to you an understanding of truth that will eliminate the frustration experienced by Pontius Pilate. And to do this, we must first realize the essential mark of truth is conformity or correspondence between two things. This is all truth. There's no exceptions. When we talk about truth, we're talking about conformity. A simple example, when building houses, the builder has to check frequently to see if the various parts are true or not. By true, he means it's, it corresponds to his level or his ruler. Thus, a floor, a wall is true when it is level and flat. If it does not conform to the straightness and flatness of the ruler and level, we say it is warped or it is twisted. With this essential notion of truth in mind, we can now consider the various types of truth that exist by considering what conforms to what. Keep in mind that our understanding of truth is fundamental to our knowledge and understanding of God and everything in the world. Okay, so truth is important. For this we were born. How we understand the truth and falsehood affects how we think. It affects many things, the good working of any society. It touches on every aspect of our lives, what we know, how we know it, what we believe and why we believe it who we have as our friends, how we live our lives and how we die, all depend on our understanding of truth. This I hope to show with some important examples later. 
Now, truth is fundamental. It's foundational. A small mistake in the foundation leads to bigger problems later. So, what is of prime importance here is this. If we get the fundamentals of truth wrong, it can lead to some pretty serious problems later. As all of us should know by now, a small error in the premises can lead to bigger problems in the conclusion. A problem in the foundation of a house is much more serious than problems in the exterior. You don't want to make a mistake at the bottom because the whole thing will fall down. Truth is fundamental. Listen to St. Teresa. She recounts how His Majesty came to her and said, All the harm that comes to the world comes from its not knowing the truths of Scripture in clarity and truth. Alas, daughter, how few there are who truthfully love me. Do you know what it is to love me truthfully? It is to understand that everything that is displeasing to me is a lie. Everything that is displeasing to me is a lie. Father Frederick Faber, he speaks of heaven. Heaven is the land of love, but the hatred of heresy will not diminish there. For the hatred of heresy is the adoring love of God's ever-blessed truth. So, what's he saying? People, saints in heaven. There is hatred in heaven. They hate something in heaven. What do they hate? Error. Lies. Falsehood. Heresy. Even in the sea of love that is heaven, they hate untruth. So let's begin with our education, our deepening our knowledge and understanding of traditional definition of truth. So the types of truth can be determined by reflecting on what conforms to what. Let's start with the traditional understanding of truth as was clarified by St. Thomas Aquinas. It wasn't made up by him. He was using long-standing tradition. And then we'll look at the more modern view of truth. Okay. In the traditional understanding of truth, let us begin at the highest level and work our way down. Yes, truth has levels. It is hierarchical. That's very helpful to understand that. Using analogy, if we were giving you an instruction on how to use a piece of equipment, the most important truths I would communicate to you first and then move on to lesser things. Thus, those things that could endanger your life are more important than those things that might cause a little discomfort. And you need to know what will endanger your life first, lest you make that mistake early on and die. And I have to go to prison for not telling you. So there's different kinds of truth based on what conforms to what. Different kinds of truth means there's levels of truth. And different levels of truth means truth is hierarchical. If you can understand that there is a hierarchy throughout the entire universe, you're already well ahead of the modern errors. Always look for the hierarchy in things and you'll solve your problem. First and highest truth is God himself. The highest truth is to be found in the highest being. And we find this truth is God. It's in God who said, I am who am. And the truth in God is found between the infinitely perfect conformity between God knowing himself and God is known. God knowing is the Father, and what he knows is the Son, or the Word of God. Between the knower and the known, between the Father and the Son, there is infinitely complete and perfect conformity or correspondence. In God, the knower and the known are also persons. So the Son of God is truth. This means that truth at its highest level is personal. This is why our Lord said in the Gospel of St. John, I am the truth. This is also why any violation of the truth, that is some kind of a lie or fabrication, is always offensive to God. So we may think that this little lie will not hurt anyone, but that is incorrect. It hurts God who is truth. And in a moment, I hope to show you 
how it will also hurt you. Truth is personal at the highest level. All truth flows from this one truth. Since God created the universe, then all that is true will flow from him, the one truth. If it's not of him, it will be a lie. It'll be a perversion of something he made. As we read in the prologue of St. John's Gospel, it was through the word that all things were created, and without him nothing was created. And this brings us to the next level of truth, which we'll cover in the next slide. How things in creation conform to the word of the Creator. It is instructive to note that both Aristotle and Plato had an understanding of this without divine revelation. They figured this out. They understood Aristotle considered God as the first cause, which is the same as saying he caused all things or created all things. He is the uncaused cause. Plato understood that things in this world had to conform in some way to the exemplars in heaven, their forms. That's what he held it to be. Thus, to be human, we have to participate in the form or exemplar of humanity. The more we participate, the more human we become. Neither of these men worked from divine revelation. They figured it out by looking at God's creation. So let's go to the next slide and see that the first level of truth after God as personal truth, God is the first truth, the next level down in our hierarchy is what is called ontological truth. Next level of truth. Created things conform to God's idea of them. St. Thomas and others call this ontological truth. This is a fancy word for saying that things made by God are true inasmuch as they conform to his idea of them. So ontological, ontology, the study of being, study of existence, essence of things, just a fancy word. Looking at creatures as God willed them. Now, note the direction of conformity. It is the thing outside conforming to the idea on the inside. Thing out there must conform here. So the direction is, is I got the idea, I'm going to make it out there. Direction is going out, making sure this thing conforms to this. The idea or form precedes or is prior to the thing outside. I come up with an idea, then it's going to be made. Starts here, goes out. So the first kind of ontological truth, there's two kinds, is that which God uses to make things. Okay, There is that which is of God and that which is of man. That's the second kind. We'll talk about that next. For God, as we have said, it refers to how creation conforms to his word. These are creatures. So created things conform to God's idea of them. Now we have the second kind, which is of man. It holds for man when he is making something. These are called artifacts. Note the difference. God creates, we make, with what he gave us. Example, an architect has the idea of a building in his mind and then sets about making the available materials conform to this idea. So Michelangelo and had the statue of David or the Pieta in his mind and sets about making the marble conform to it. The more these things conform to the idea, the more true they are. This is ontological truth. So man makes things to conform to his own idea. Every artist should understand that one. The more it conforms to his idea, the more true it is. Now we should stop here and pause for a moment and reflect that divine revelation has told us that God made the world, the universe, perfect at the beginning. It was truthful because it conformed to his word. But we also know that he placed the ability to choose freely in certain creatures, namely angels and men. So God did not create anything defective. Everything was made according to his word, and it was made well. 
But the devil and his companions, about a third of the angels, chose not to serve God. These angels fell and became perverted and twisted angels. They saw the Son of God somehow in vision, prevision, and they refused to serve the truth. And they fell. We call them demons. This is why our Lord said to the Pharisees that the devil is the father of lies. He is the first liar. The first to deform the truth. There you go. The abuse of the free choice of the will brought lies and perversions into the created order. So he stood not in the truth, our Lord tells us, because truth is not in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. So ontologically, he is deformed and perverted being. Artistically, he's always shown as some kind of a perversion, oftentimes associated with sewer items. And so he was experienced by the saints as well. Adam and Eve embraced his lie, and man became duplicitous. He became divided, as we're well aware. Adam and Eve chose to follow the counsel of this twisted angel, disguised as a serpent, and this brought lying into the heart of man, such that duplicity is a part of our daily life now. Such that people like Pilate exclaim, what is truth? Thus our Lord exclaims that things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and those things defile a man. For from the man, from the heart of man come forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. So, the consequence, we have three images of man. When God makes things, he makes them according to his word. And when making us, he made us in his own image. But due to this duplicity that entered in at the very beginning, we can deduce that there are really three images of ourselves. There is that image I have of my own self, which is flawed. Most people have an exaggerated view of themselves. Do we not find it hard to hear what others have to say about our faults? Next, there's the image that God has of us. So there's my own image, and then God sees me as I really am. He can see everything about us, even the secret recesses of our hearts in which we find ourselves, we struggle to see ourselves as we really are. If only we could see, we might die. We'd faint from the sight. Some of the saints did faint when they were shown themselves. Now, the third of the image is that he has an image of what he wants us to be. Saints in heaven. This touches upon the ontological truth that he has in mind for us. He wants us to become saints, and this is exactly what happens when all these things become one image. How is that going to happen? First, we have to strive to know ourselves as we truly are, and then we do something about it with the help of God. And in time, we become what God wants us to be, saints. And we then arrive in heaven, and the truth is unveiled, and we see face to face. Now, there's one more point that we should make on this kind of truth. Most Bibles wrongly translate the words of the Archangel Gabriel to Blessed Mary at the Annunciation as saying, nothing is impossible for God. In fact, as far as I know, the only Bible that gets it right is the Douay Rings. Imagine that. No, the true translation based on the Greek and the Latin is no word is impossible for God. This is very significant because the word here harkens back to the one truth, which is the word of God. Nothing is impossible for God when it flows from God, knowing himself perfectly. So if it's a part of the word, then it will work. Now, a very important conclusion comes out of this. There are things impossible for God, like lying. God cannot lie because he cannot contradict himself. God cannot make another God because he is uncreated. And there's only one uncreated being. And that's God, right? 
This is, by the way, is one of the places where Islam fails miserably because Islam holds that God's omnipotence takes precedence in God. But truth precedes power in God. God cannot exercise a power that contradicts the truth. Using our Trinitarian theology, which flows from divine revelation, we know that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, and that this Spirit is the power of God, often called the finger of God in the Scriptures and the love of God in our sacred writings, the church. So, God the Father creates, God the Son comes and redeems, and then God the Holy Ghost comes and sanctifies. In that order. Creation, incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection, then Pentecost. This means that truth in God precedes power and love. For us, this means that power must always be based upon what is true. And when it is not so, tyranny results, abuse results. Also, it means that the first duty of love is truth. Because I won't be able to love you properly unless I speak truthfully to you. You cannot say you love someone while lying to them or flattering them. It's not true love. It's utilitarian. I want you to do something for me, therefore I'm going to tell you what you want to hear, so you'll do it. I want you to rub my back, so I'll tell you what will make you happy, so you'll do it. Okay, let's go to the next level. Logical truth. So we had God as personal truth, ontological truth, how things are formed according to the idea that precedes them. Now we're going to go to logical truth. The next level of truth St. Thomas discusses is more common to our daily life because it touches on how we know things. So here's a tree. How do I know this tree? The conformities between our intellects or minds and the things known outside of us or between things in our thoughts. Inside, we're thinking of things, trying to construct things. This, St. Thomas calls logical truth. Note the direction is the reverse of what we saw in ontological truth. The direction there was going out, and here it's coming in. The thing known precedes or is prior to our knowing it. So the conformity is our mind conforming to the thing known. The more we can wrap our minds around something, the more we know it as it truly is. The more we come to know it. The more information we can gather about something, the more we can conform our minds to it. So, here's a little example. A sort of truth can also exist in the abstract thinking of our minds. So, we're looking at this tree, and we're saying, okay, this is a tree. It's not a mineral, it's not animal, etc., Okay, now I go look at the leaves and I say, well, this is an oak tree. This is not a fruit or evergreen tree. And then I can make some conclusions about the truth. This is a safe tree to climb. It won't break very easy. This is a safe tree in which to build a tree fort, etc. Okay. This sort of truth can also exist in the exact abstract thinking as we just displayed between subjects and predicates. So thinking about our pet, we can say that Tom is a cat. Tom is not a dog. Now, the last kind of truth, now, last kind of truth is the virtue of truthfulness. Virtue of truthfulness. This is very important. This is usually what we think about when we speak of lying. The virtue inclines man to manifest himself in this life, in his speech, in his dress, according to the conviction of his mind. It seeks to perfect man's ability to communicate outwardly, whether by word or action, what he holds to be true in his mind and heart. The conformity is between interior and exterior of the man himself. This is why our Lord said to us, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more, it comes from the evil one. Imagine that. It is to this kind of truth that most people think of when lies are mentioned. So let us reflect a moment on the fact that lying is not only offensive to God, it also hurts us. It hurts the individual who lies. The lack of conformity between what we believe and hold to be right 
And how we act and behave causes much unrest and discord in the soul. It's a duplicity. Such behavior is also damaging to the society around us. If men will not truthfully communicate with each other, they will not believe each other, making it more and more difficult to live together. A sort of tribal mentality begins to form more and more. In any community, the need for virtue of truthfulness is essential. Think of a marriage, a family, any sort of team. What happens when we find out that someone is lying to us? We're wary of that person and avoid dealing with them. Think of our country. What happens when we find out that we've been lied to by the media? Unfortunately, some people are so dumb, they turn it back on and watch the next day. Why? They're lying to you. It shows you the power of TV. What happens when we're lied to by government officials? Once people lose their trust in those that are above them to take care of them, they become grasping causing society to break down. More laws are enacted to force us to do things we don't want to do. They look out for number one instead of the common good of the community. It causes unrest that can lead to grave evils, including riots and wars. Now, not too long ago, back in the 90s, we had the Rwanda genocide. And it was started by the mass media. Used, it was used to propagate lies and to stir up people to the point that genocidal war broke out and took the lives of nearly a million people in a month's time. Neighbor killed neighbor. They were friends before. They pulled out a machete and chopped their neighbor to pieces. Now, you study the French Revolution to get the people to hate uh, Marie Antoinette they printed all kinds of false papers on her. Over and over, they're pumping out all these papers, trying to lie about her and get people to believe lies. And before long, they killed Marie Antoinette. It's very dangerous. So truth is essential for unity and peace. There can be no real unity without building on the foundation of truth. So we like to say the only truth that will hurt you is a twisted truth. The real truth ultimately will set you free. So let's summarize now what we've learned. We've got the traditional levels, traditional understanding of truth. It starts with God. He's the first truth. He is truth itself. It's personal. Then we have ontological truth that he made the world according to his idea. Then we have the logical truth that we come to know it and we think about it inside, and then we live according to the truth. We have the virtue, a moral virtue of truthfulness. Very powerful teaching. Very powerful teaching. Thank you, St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, before we move on to the more modern view of truth, we need to reflect on a few more important points to f that follow from this traditional view of truth. First, even the ancient Greeks recognized that sciences were distinguished by the level of truth they sought. So we just saw that truth has levels. So you have sciences depending on what level you're at. These sciences are going to be, guess what? Hierarchical. Makes perfect sense. The higher the truth, the higher the science. And the higher the science it can correct and help out the lower sciences. Because the principles for the higher science are more universal, more applicable than the ones down below. They have a higher vantage point from which they can see. Okay. This is powerful. I know it's a lot to absorb, but this is so important for the time in which we live. The highest science is that which studies the highest truth, namely God. Its body of knowledge is divine revelation. Recall that science is the study of some field of knowledge. This is the sacred science of theology. Theos and logos put together. Logos meaning a word, study of. Then you have theos, God, study of God. 
Next, we have metaphysics and philosophy, the study of natural truths that are more universal, more abstract. So metaphysics studies the essence of things that are not physical, not visible to our eyes necessarily. We have to abstract the essence from things using our minds. That's why we're human and not animals. We can do that. Now, then comes physics, which includes a study of the universe's more material components, but still more or less universal phenomena like gravity, light. We can still study those things too. They're physical though. After this comes various other more specific fields of study like biology. Bios, pos, logos, biology. And finally comes practical sciences like engineering. So the more universal and abstract, the higher the truth. A couple of examples of how the higher sciences help out the lower. In engineering, they use the laws of physics to help build things. Engineers do not tell physicists what the laws are. The physicists tell the engineers what the laws are. Let me tell you, I studied engineering for seven years. We thought we were the apple of the eye of the world. And we weren't going to take any advice from those physicists. but Because we thought we were the ones that made the world turn. We were so prideful. But anyway, that's because we didn't know that we are at the bottom of the heap. Look at that. Engineering is at the very bottom. They're low. They think they're everything because they can make a Ferrari, make a jet fly. Well, how did they do that? Guess how they did it? They needed this help. Okay? So, from theology, another example is that we know the universe was created. It's theology that tells us that divine revelation. It's not eternal, and it's made ex nihilo from nothing. Science cannot, science as in physics cannot tell us that. Neither can metaphysics. We must have theology to know that. Now these truths are object based. Finally, a very important point to be made is simply this. This view of truth is object-based. First and foremost, according to this understanding of things, man strives to know God as the supreme object worth knowing. The supreme being. Second, the mind accepts that God made things a certain way. This is a tree. He made it like this. Thus, man humbly accepts creation, all its objects around him as coming from God. And they have been this way from the beginning. There's always been trees. They've always been like this. Thus, in this way, the truth is the adequation of the intellect and reality. It's the conformity between the thought and the thing that is an object to be known in itself. So man humbly accepts things as God made them from the beginning in a certain way. And, of course, man seeks to imitate his creator by making things and doing things according to the truth. Okay, let's summarize. Traditional understanding of truth. To sum up this position, we could say that this traditional understanding of truth is timeless since it starts with God Himself and flows from His creating all things through His eternal Word. It's timeless. It's from God. It's vertical in that it seeks to elevate man's mind upward to the Creator. That's one thing nice about hierarchy. It always lifts you up. It lifts you up in that it seeks to elevate man's mind upward to the Creator. It's clear. It's ordered. It's hierarchical. It's object-based. It's of the rational part of man. You'll see why that's important in a moment. It's unchanging and permanent in that it depends upon the essences God placed in things from the beginning and they do not change. As St. Paul says of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All this makes truth humble. We conform to it, to God's creation. We do not make it conform to us. Okay, that's an essential understanding of traditional truth. It's timeless. It's vertical. 
It's hierarchical, it's ordered, it's object-based, it's rational, it's unchanging. It is humble. Now let's look at the new understanding of truth. Rene Descartes is one of the persons we can look to where this came from. More recent view of truth that has come from modernity and the Enlightenment. Seems to me that the one who captures this more modern approach the best is the famous French philosopher Rene Descartes, dubbed the father of modern philosophy. Descartes rightly perceived that all truths were linked with one another, but for him, he wanted to find that one truth that could not be doubted. And once he found that truth, he could then use it as the fundamental truth and proceed with logic to open the way to all science, to all understanding. Seeking this one fundamental truth, Descartes took a little journey of doubting. Instead of seeing the reality around him as a certain and real thing, he doubted it since he had been wrong before. So haven't you been driving down the road and you see a big mountain range? It looks like one from a distance, and it's just a bank of clouds. Starmy clouds, look like snow-covered mountains. I was wrong. Or we see a paddle bent in water. We say, hey, I've been wrong about something before. I might be wrong about everything. And so he doubted and he doubted and he doubted everything until he realized he was doubting. He could not doubt that he was doubting. Thus he concluded, I think, therefore I am. And so he proceeded to build his entire philosophical system on man's rational powers. He based his even his existence on this, I think, therefore I am. It's too bad he didn't realize that he was making himself God. He should have said, I think, therefore I am who am. I think, therefore, I am who am, which is blasphemous. But that's where he ends up, making himself God. Now, modern thinkers adopt Descartes. Immanuel Kant died in 1804. He supported this idea. He said, have the courage to use your own understanding. That's the motto of the Enlightenment. He considered it immature to be guided by another, namely the church and by divine revelation. He wanted pure reason to be the guide for discerning and knowing all things. No one is going to tell me what to think. Use your own understanding. Private judgment, I'll decide. Now, this new truth becomes subject-based. Remember, the old one is object-based. God made these things, I conform. Subject-based. It's a diabolical disorientation. This leads to a near-complete reversal of everything I just presented above. No longer do we have an object-based reality, a reality based on the objects that God has placed there by His thinking about them and making them and commanding them to be. But rather, it becomes a subject-based reality. Man becomes the source of all ontological truth. Man has taken the place of God. All depends on the thinking and experience of man. Thus, the controversy of the ancient Greek Protagoras came back with Descartes. For it was Protagoras who said, man is the measure of all things. And didn't we not grow up with the idea, didn't we not grow up with the idea that man is the measure of all things? Or with the other idea, what is it? Mind over matter. Just put your mind to it. Go out there and do it. Make it happen. Put your mind to it. I mean, I've heard that all my life. That's from this way of thinking. It's not like this. What does the Lord want me to do? I need to go discern what God's will is for me. What will please Him the most? No! Put your mind to it. Go do it. That's what we're taught. Man will decide what is true and false, what is good and bad. Man will make things conform to his ideas. I'll make it happen. <laughs> now, the new truth will involve a sort of motion then, a sort of a coming. Before we can accurately summarize the new view of truth that arises from this way of proceeding, we need to examine a few more elements of, of importance 
And that is simply this. These various men kind of gave contributions during the Enlightenment. Newton, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin are examples. They saw the world as under the aspect of motion, strife, and struggle. Newton spoke of forces, Darwin of natural selection and evolution, while Hegel and Marx used the notion of dialectic. The key factor is becoming. Now, none of these guys want to talk about sin and divisions caused by sin, and that's where the struggle is coming from. No, no, no. We've got to work at things and make it happen, not overcome our sinfulness and learn to love each other. Now we've got the Hegelian dialectic that came out of this. This is extremely important stuff. Modern philosophers such as Hegel propose a dialectical, I know it's a fancy word, okay, but it's a dialectical view of nature and history. Namely, that there's a thesis which is contradicted by an antithesis and resolved by some sort of synthesis. And then it goes on with another antithesis and thesis and another synthesis until we make progress. So we've got over here, uh, let's see, Islam, get over there, Christianity, they fight it out and we get a flattening, a new situation. I want divorce and remarry to receive Holy Communion, so I say, well, I got the dogma over here, right? It says that can't happen, but I got the pastoral practice over here that I'm going to pit against it, and these two are going to fight it out, maybe in a synod or two, and I'm going to make a synthesis come out of this. You see that? You see why this is important? I got over here, I got my dogma, I got my teaching, I got over here, I got my pastoral. They divide the two, which cannot be divided, but they do it. And they say, look, they can, these can exist together. And then we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll make some progress. Communism loves this. They love to pit people against each other. Nations and peoples and families and husbands and wives. Adam and Eve were pitted against each other with the devil. Children work on their parents to get at, at, at each other so they can get what they want. They know how to do this. All this is bad. This is from fallen human nature, and it's at its worst. Now, here's a very important example of this. Today, Saul Alinsky. I mean, one should not pass over this guy lightly. It's incredible how important it is, even what's happening before our very eyes. Saul Alinsky died in 1972. The author of two very dangerous books, Reveille for Radicals and Rules for Radicals. He explains his devilish dialectics. Listen to these very important words. The first step in community organization is community disorganization. So I want to cause disorganization. I want people to be at each other disorganized so they'll feel uncomfortable. The organizer, who's going to cause disorganization, dedicated to changing the life of a particular community, maybe the whole world, must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community. So find out what Christians don't like. Muslims, no problem. Come on over, Muslims, bring it. See that? What do Americans don't like? We don't like our guns taken away. Okay, let's try to cause some gun incidences and cause the gun laws to be increased so we can take away those American guns and make them mad. Maybe even get them to use the guns more. Fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. Let's get them to use their guns so we can take them away from them. We want them to use them. We want to provoke those people. He must search out controversy, Alinsky says. People must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost so futureless in the prevailing system that they are willing to let go of the past, tradition, and chance the future. What does tradition say? Hold your leaders in a pious frame of mind. Because you recognize God's authority working through them. What do we want now? We want people to dis disrespect, to hate their leaders, to despise them, to want the dead. The job of the organizer is to maneuver and bait the establishment so that it will publicly attack him as a dangerous enemy. 
Such a counterattack then puts the organizer on the side of the people. A revolutionary organizer must shake up the prevailing patterns of the people's lives, agitate, create disenchantment and discontent with the current values to produce a passion for what? Change. Notice how these leaders today are always put as the people's leader. They're loved by the common people as they destroy our lives. That's Saul Alinsky at work. This is Hegelian dialectic being used on us. And we feel it. People are arming themselves, <laughs> stacking up their guns, waiting for the day. Very dangerous. First critical pitfall of the new truth is that the rule of non-contradiction is violated. The rule of non-contradiction basically states that one thing cannot be another at the same time in the same way. Yet those holding fast to the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, dialectic of Hegel do not immediately abide by the rule of non-contradiction. We can have the dogma, the doctrine of marriage over here. The pastoral practices can be different and contradictory. That's okay. The violation of non-contradiction What's it cause? Cognitive dissidence in the mind of a true believer. We feel confusion. We feel frustration, anger. We leave. Getting out of here. Go and sit up a contest. Whatever. The devil wins. So we have these duplicitous situations going on. You study your history, you study your teachings, you go back to the uh, infallible teaching of Pope Pius IX, the syllabus of errors, and you see all these things condemned, and you turn on the TV, and you read some blog or something of what's been said recently by someone in high authority, and it's totally contradictory. And they say, but I'm Catholic. Wait a minute. Uh, what's going on? I don't get it. How can the Pope be here saying this back then and now saying this now? They don't go together. This is the Hegelian thing at work before our very eyes. We have two masses in the Latin rite. We've got the extraordinary form, we've got the ordinary form. Let's face it, they don't get along. We look at each other across the aisle. It's a thesis and antithesis and it's supposed to hammer out to become a synthesis. Recently, we saw the Pope going to uh, Cuba. Big picture of Che Guevara, mass murderer, revolutionary extraordinary. And then here's a crucifix over here, see? And we're supposed to say, these go together? Are you crazy? The new truth, as embraced today, using these faulty ways of thinking, the new understanding of truth can be captured as the conformity between the mind and life. This is their definition. It's predominated over the last century or more. It's a new revolutionary view of truth, a new revolutionary definition. This is the adequation of thought and life. And this is total reversal of the established order of truth as the adequation of thought to things that are fixed in their essence. This means that if life changes, so will what I believe as true change with it. Listen to Garrigou Lagrange, a giant of the Dominican order and of theology back in the 1940s and 50s. He says, for them, the truth is no longer that which is, but that which is becoming and is constantly and always changing. So what's another pitfall? of this new truth, relativism. Note here that such a position effectively cuts off ontological truth based on God as the creator, cuts him out of the picture. Man now is the measure of all things, not God, not the word of God. According to this way of proceeding, there's also no acceptance of the essence of things that God has made. Thus, modern man falls into relativism and he uses what? Evolution as his understanding of how things are and they will change in the future to something else. Things are evolving, changing. Each man has his own rational ability, his own experiences of life. And thus, each man 
will have a different view on what is true and what is not true. So potentially, each man can make his own little world, his own little universe. And that's what's happening. Here's some recent examples. Now, I'm telling you, I could find many more that are more current, but 2013 is not that long ago. So I didn't even bother, because you can find them. Believe me, they're floating all over the place. But this is from the interview with Pope Francis. We shouldn't hide our heads in the sand, but face the truth as it really is. I'm not attacking his person. I'm trying to say this is something he stated. It's public. It's on the Internet. It's on the Vatican website. Okay, let's look at it. The only truth that will hurt you is a twisted truth. Keep that in mind. Now, 2013, interview with Pope Francis. Everyone has his own idea of good and evil. Everyone has his own idea of good and evil. There it is, right there. Now, to be fair, this was a reported interview. There's no notes. But it was published on the Vatican website. So it seems to be accepted. So everyone has his own idea of good and evil. What about God's idea of good and evil? What about his divine revelation? He's got their own idea. And everyone should follow the good and fight evil as he conceives them. I'm not going to conform to what God says. I'll decide what's good and evil. November 2013, the Italian president quoted Pope Francis. In your words, we have felt vibrate the spirit of the Second Vatican Council as, quote, a rereading of the gospel in the light of contemporary culture, end quote. A rereading. In other words, we're going to take the gospel and we're going to make it conform to today. Not we conform to it. You see the reversal? Rene Descartes strikes again. October 2014, Synod, Instrumentum Laboris. They were hoping to have a public discussion which could permit a rereading of the concept of the natural law in a more meaningful manner in today's world. Imagine that. We need to reread the natural law to fit us. 2014. German ethics panel ruling on whether a brother or a sister could legally marry, quoting Justice Anthony Kennedy, our own Supreme Court Justice. Quote, at the heart of liberty, that comes from hell, is the right to define one's own concept of existence. I have the right to define my existence of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. And then they allowed a brother and sister to marry in Germany, legally. Listen to this statement from the interviewer of Pope Francis, that 2013 interview. This is extremely prescient, very telling. Your Holiness, may I tell you something about my own cultural background? I was raised by a mother who was a strict Catholic. At the age of 12, I won a catechism contest held by all the parishes in Rome, and I was given a prize by the vicariate. I was a practicing Catholic and a true believer. But all that changed when I entered high school. I read, among other philosophical texts, that we studied René Descartes. Imagine that. This course on method I read, and I was struck by the phrase which has now become an icon. I think... Therefore, I am. The individual thus became the basis of human experience, the seat of free thought. The individual, the man himself, became the basis of human existence, the seat of free thought. He laid the foundation for a very different vision, and I happened to follow that path, which later, supported by other things, I read led me to a very different place. Now, I believe in being, capital B, that is in the tissue from which forms, bodies arise. Being is the fabric of energy. God's just the energy that holds the universe together. 
chaotic but indestructible energy and eternal chaos. Not order. This is blasphemy. This is from hell. This is directly from the occult. This man went to the occult. Unknowing to him, he went straight into it because he followed the path of Rene Descartes. He goes on and on about this energy. It's all occult. So we must stop for a moment and consider the occult connections. Madame Helena Blatovatsky, she died in 1891. She's like the devil's St. Teresa of Jesus is for us. That's his mystical bride. Madame Helena Blatovatsky, founders of theosophy. See the snake around her finger? She's trying to give you the evil eye even there. Enough of her. Okay. The occult connections. She was seeking ways to liberate the human mind. Imagine that. Liberate it from what? I don't want to conform to God. I want to be free. When asked, is there such a thing as an absolute truth in the hands of any one party or man? She answers, there cannot be. There's no room for absolute truth upon any subject whatsoever. But there are relative truths and we have to make the best we can of them. Total relativist. There it is. Relativism. Madame Helena Balavatsky. One of her life's goals, should sound familiar to us, unfortunately, is to encourage the study of comparative religion. Let's look at all the religions in the world. They got something to offer. Philosophy, comparative philosophy and science. She held that the truth is the substratum and basis of all the world's religions and philosophies. What truth is the basis of all the world's religions and philosophies? Relative truth. This is not a complimentary statement. Relativism is a cult based. It flows out of the mouth of the devil. So let's summarize. Whereas the traditional view of truth is God-centered, the latter is man-centered. The one is vertical since it looks up or leads up one up while the other is horizontal, since it looks out or down. It will go down sooner or later, as that one interviewer discovered. He found his way right into the occult. Whereas there was hierarchy in the truths before, all is flattened now, or even inverted, and is egalitarian, it's leveled, it's equal. Whereas the traditional view of truth is timeless, this one is temporal, since it is based on man's view of life, which is always becoming. Whereas the traditional view was more defined, clear and limpid, this one tends to be confused and chaotic, since it always is developing and changing. It is unstable. It's revolutionary. Remember what that man said? It's chaos. Eternal chaos. Whereas the traditional form of truth operates from the rational part of man, this form of truth easily becomes more charismatic since it easily falls prey to man's emotions, affections, feelings, and imagination. His experiences. The traditional view is humble in that it accepts things the way God made them and seeks to use them according to their nature's the new way manipulates the natures of things to conform to his ideas. Mind over matter. There's a battle going on here. Traditional truth versus modern truth. Let's consider how this battle is played out in a few categories. Food and nutrition. Hey, traditionally, we accept the way that God made the food supply and we work with it accordingly. We work with a genetic code already present and given by God. And so we have things like hybrids. We can kind of experiment and see how it works out. But in modern mind, it does not accept these things. It seeks to modify things to fit man's needs. What does he do? He strips away what God's given. So we process the food. Why? We want it to last a long time on the shelf. Also, he will modify them by doing genetic modified organisms, 
I'll decide what kind of genes this thing needs. Does that sound right to you? Nature is biting back. We have all kinds of health problems. America is one of the most unhealthy countries in the world. Tons of cancer because of what we're eating. Given all this food that lasts forever on the shelf, it's killing us. Okay, I mean, you can see how this definition of truth has really affected us. Even with what we eat, we have revolution present in our food system. All kinds of chemicals and stuff there. Okay, let's look at art. Traditional view of art, it's usually vertical, traditional. You know, you make, it's meditative. I want you to think about something, something higher. It's usually very detailed. It's very ordered. People, when you're at a museum, go to a museum sometime and just study where people are looking and what they spend their time in front of. You'll notice that there's always groups of people sitting around these Renaissance and earlier paintings. Go to the modern places and the people are moving right on through. They don't stop very much. Why would they? So people gather around these traditional pieces of art and they think about higher things. The modern is very flat, often confused, mushy, unsettled. People pass by them. Undefined amorphous art equals undefined and amorphous truth. Art that is so formless, so it equals truth that is formless and could mean whatever people want it to mean. Yikes. Here's an example. And I guess Picasso, I mean, he could actually paint very well. But he was reflecting his inside there. Huh? G.K. Chesterton summed it up quite well, if you remember. He said, first there was art for God's sake. Then there was art for man's sake. Then there was art for art's sake. And now there is no art for God's sake. But if you go to a museum, you can see the, the decay in man's mind and his understanding of, of God and his revelation. You go back to pre-Renaissance times, very, very devout. And then you've got the Renaissance, which has a mixture. And you can see there was some more painting being paid by the church to paint these beautiful paintings. They're also on the side painting some muses or some Greek Roman thing. The clothes started to come off. And then you got like in the 17th and 18th centuries, maybe they're painting a lot of humans all of a sudden, a lot of man, hardly anything of God. And then you get to the 19th and 20th centuries and they're just going downhill. Weird stuff starts to pop out. The communist goals for America continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. An American communist cell was told to eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings, substitute shapeless, awkward, and meaningless forms. I think they've been successful there. Uh, control arts critics and directors of art museums. Our plan is to promote ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art. Hmm. I think they have had some success. Sad to say. Architecture is similar to art. Like art, the traditional understanding of Truth inspires buildings that are vertical, meditative, and uplifting. It builds churches that are Christocentric or cross-shaped. They were the highest buildings in town. Nothing was allowed to be higher. Now, working from the latter understanding of truth, man builds churches that are round. See, there's that nice cross-shaped. Chart, cathedral. You can see there's a battle going on. Here's man today, Atlas, holding up the world and all these ugly buildings around. Then you got St. Patrick's right in the middle of it. And they all dwarf St. Patrick's. So there's, this is more important than church. We don't want this to be the highest building around. We want to hide it. That's New York way of thinking there. Huh? Well, this is what we got now. Now no one knows for sure whether they are at a church or not. The churches are round, flat, and man-centered. Man builds skyscrapers like modern towers of Babel to look down on the churches, as we've seen. Churches of old were built to be permanent, like St. John Lateran is still up, as old as can be. 
It's supposed to last to the end of the world. Some of these churches will last. Well, the new ones are temporary, not built to last very long. The early churches were intricate, ordered, symmetrical, and even cosmic in their design. The Chartres Cathedral is cosmic in its design. All kinds of cosmic realities are represented in it. Their symbols leave nothing to be guessed at. Rather, they're beautiful puzzles to be worked out. They were hierarchically arranged. They were hierarchically arranged. One had to climb stairs to enter them. The sanctuaries were elevated. Now, sad to say, some of these churches, you actually have to go down. They're like auditoriums like this one. I actually used to attend this church when I was in college. This is in Corvallis, Oregon. Oregon State University. This is St. Mary's. Of course, it was something like Our Lady Help of Christian. Can't have that anymore. Just St. Mary's. It's like an auditorium where the most important thing is what? You know it. The sound system. That's the most important thing in a modern church. The sound system. The heating systems, the cooling and lighting systems come in second and third maybe. There's rarely anything about them that lifts the soul heavenward, but rather flat or even worse. Some having the sanctuary and altar in the lowest place. What happened to the high altar? What happened to going up to the mountain of God? To the altar of God. In Choibo, Adaltaridei. Adem Quelatificat Yuventutumea. We don't want to be young anymore. We don't want to have God as our Father, it seems. We want to go down. Some of them have purposely arranged things in an asymmetrical manner to give the feeling of uneasiness and that one is in motion. So oftentimes you go into these new churches and all the furniture is strangely arranged and you feel uncomfortable. Everything's out of place. That's done on purpose. Let's go to music. The first truth leads to music that elevates the heart and mind upwards without focusing on any one man involved. Here I'm thinking of Gregorian chant and polyphony and various classical works. These forms of music do not highlight individual men or instruments, but are sung and performed such that all can contribute to its symphonies. And so God is inevitably the theme of these works. They're enduring. We still use them. They're very inspiring to this day. They strike us in the rational part, in the spiritual part of our souls, and they filter down. It is interesting to note that Gregorian Chan has been proven to settle restless souls. In a nursing home I have visited, more than one actually, they, they talk about how it helps certain aberrations in older people. There's these certain aberrations where they just can't sit still, so they're just walking all, all day long. And they give them Gregorian chant, and they calm down. They calm down. Modern music, unfortunately, we hear this all the time. As time has progressed, the other truth began to take precedence in the formation of music. That is, it began to conform to man's new way of thinking. Soon operas became famous where soloists, soloists were highlighted. Man became the focus. The 20th century gave birth to all sorts of jumpy, passionate, and emotional music. Such music rarely appeals to the rational part of man. It always starts with the emotional or lower part of man. Many of the lyrics are more or less confused and even dangerous having themes of licentiousness, drugs, violence, and rebellion, and even Satanism. And oftentimes they repeat themselves over and over where you just can't take it anymore if you're actually listening. I mean, I remember that one song, Tell Me Lies, Tell Me Sweet Little Lies. Huh? That kind of fits with our theme today. And they just don't stop. So you're, you're going to go out and tell lies now, see? You've been brainwashed. Furthermore, the music is moody, with people often choosing a piece of music or its artist to make them feel a certain way, one that will match their particular mood. Certain military and police officers and men have been known to listen to certain kinds of heavy metal music to get themselves into a certain frame of mind to do something without thinking about it too much. 
That's a fact. It's been proven. Okay. Very scary. That's where this is ending up. See, these different definitions of truth will lead down these different paths. Okay, morality. One of the most important things we can discuss tonight. The first definition of truth leads to unchanging and unbending morality because it is an object-based morality as summarized by the Ten Commandments. And this is what the stone tablets symbolize. They are engraved in the stone of this universe. They are timeless. God is saying, I made you this way. And so sin is more black and white. Object-based. What is wrong is always wrong and everywhere wrong. Cannot be fiddled with. We cannot reread the natural law to fit our modern way of thinking. It doesn't work. So you can see why there's like a big conflict in the world. The people that understand truth are hearing these others over here say, we've got to reread this. They're like going, what? See that? There's a huge battle going on between these two different basic understandings. Let's go to the modern understanding of morality. Since man is always becoming, man is evolving morally, producing a subject-based morality, is not being relative. This is why we have things like values clarification. So is morality is always becoming what is wrong for me yesterday may not be wrong for me tomorrow. So values clarification was introduced some time ago as a method that merely attempts to make a person know his or her own personal morality, clarify it to him. So in my high school, Catholic high school, the teacher uh, drew on the board a line. On this side, he put, abortion is legal. And then he put on this side, is it moral? And then, of course, you know what happened next. We broke up into little groups. Imagine that. And we sat there and discussed it. And by the time we were done, we presented our cases. And only a few people in the class agreed, only a few, that abortion was always wrong, no matter what. Everybody else had determined certain situations in which it was okay. Values clarification. The teacher never clarified the Catholic teaching. We left class with our own values clarified. Yes for some, no for others. It's okay. The first understanding of truth affects morality by pointing to God, that sin hurts him. The latter is more concerned with how sin hurts man. See? See? in his environment. Thus, we have new sins against the environment. And the earth is being stressed more than God. Rights of man are stressed over the rights of God. If his rights are considered at all, when is the last time you heard anybody say, what is God's rights? Oftentimes, the new morality also seeks to bring God down to our level. And it often says this, oh, God will understand. Because if I were God, I would understand. I think, therefore, I am who am. The new morality tends to say things like this, well, if it feels good, it must be good, do it. How can something that feels so good possibly be so wrong? The Catholics, ugh. Everyone else is doing it. And of course, you hear this one. Well, animals can do this and do it, can't I? It must be okay. We're evolving. We came from animals. It's based on evolution. Makes things then fit their own perceptions. They will not accept the nature of things as God has given them to us. This is how a human being is made. I don't care. I want to make it this way. Man is made for a woman. Woman is made for man. I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. Many turn to surgeries to make their bodies fit their own ideas. 
Nature bites back, we get divorce, we get depression, we get disease, despair, suicide goes up, and it's legalized. We're legalizing suicide now. From the viewpoint of a priest, here's an example of it, very simple. You're in a confession, you're hearing a confession. So people come in that have a good, clear understanding of truth. And they say things like this. I did this or that so many times since my last confession. The next person comes in, maybe, but they're based upon a more modern view of truth because that's how we've been raised. And they speak about how things have hurt them or hurt them or hurting others or what situation in their life rather than confessing their sins in kind and number. They talk about their experiences rather than what's wrong, sinfully wise. And sometimes those things need to be talked about. I'm not against that. But when you come to confession, you're supposed to say, Father, bless me for I've sinned. It's been a week since my last confession. I did this so many times. You can see how that's affected us. And so sometimes confessions can be very long because the priest is trying to get them to confess their sins. No offense to anybody here. I'm not talking about anybody individual, but this is generally what's wrong today. Okay, Humanist Manifesto 1 through 3. This is, there's three levels. It started in the 1930s and the 1970s, 1980s. So there's three levels, I think. They added on to it. But just a quick, just to show you, we're getting close to the end. But we begin with humans, not God. <laughs> with nature, not deity. Using technology wisely, we can control our environment. Yes, we're doing a wonderful job. We can control poverty, markedly reduce disease. Extend our lifespan. I mean, this is a joke. All these things are just not happening. We can significantly modify our behavior. Anybody watch that Satan statue being revealed in, in Detroit? Is that what they call modifying our human behavior? Alter the course of human evolution and cultural development. GMOs, embryos, stem cell research. Unlock vast new powers. Fukushima. And provide humankind with unparalleled opportunity for achieving abundant and meaningful life. Yeah. Despair, suicides on the rise. Values and ideas, ideals, however carefully wrought, are subject to change as our knowledge and understanding advance. We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience, not from the Ten Commandments. And this is what we get. This is what's supposed to happen, but you can do whatever you want now. You can have polygamy. You can have a wife with multiple husbands. Polyandry. You can have other unsavory unions that are now legal in America. What do you want? It's up for grabs. Take your pick. A lady in Florida married a dolphin. Who can tell her not to? I have the right to make my own world. And we should spend a few moments here on language because this really is also key importance. Traditional, we seek to use language that is fixed in its meaning. It's not easily manipulated. Language that will convey truths down through time. How many times have you heard of something like this? Oh, Latin, that's a dead language. Thank God it's dead. So it can't be manipulated and fiddled with. And that's why the church's teaching has always been set in Latin to show that it's timeless. It's not going to change. What's the modern view? Well, we want a language that evolves. It's flexible and adaptable wants to use the same words, but with new and different meanings. So we have a certain double speak. So modernists, they'll keep the outward shell, they'll use the right words. I believe in hell, but it's empty. So they take the name and they gut it of its meaning and they put something else in there. And they say, see, I believe in hell. You can't condemn me as a heretic now. They want to fiddle with words. Listen to George Orwell's definition of double think. We could say double speak. To know and not to know, to be conscious 
of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. To use logic against logic to repudiate morality while laying claim to it. I'm for marriage. Traditional. Meanwhile, give communion to the divorced and remarry. Say that same-sex perverted things will bring forth meaning. To hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them, to use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy, to forget whatever it was, uh, whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. Double speak, double think. Okay, traditional viewpoint based on the traditional view of truth, understanding of truth. It's in the rational part of man. It's the highest truth. Okay, it seeks what is above and mortifies the body and whatever gets in the way from below. It is spiritually inclined, in other words. It has the truth himself as its goal. This was true of Aristotle and many like him, not just those with faith. They're always looking for what is true. The new understanding of truth has man as its focus. Thus, it tends to drop down to the immediate needs of the body. Avoiding what is painful as a general rule. Man conforms to the needs of the body first and foremost because they are more immediate. Thus, penance and mortification are things of the past. They don't make sense to people who are following the new understanding of truth. Doctors and chiropractors are seen without hesitation and often. People are quick to medicate and soothe the body. They will tend to turn to things that comfort, such as comfort foods, sleep and alcohol and TV and movies and traveling and gambling and whatever to make them feel better. This path is more of the senses, imagination and affections, whereas the other is more of the intellect and the will. It's rational. We all suffer from this. I mean, we've got a medicine cabinet. We've got a medicine cabinet. I mean, I use medicine too. Got a headache? Okay. Am I going to endure it and not get my work done? Or am I going to take a medicine? I'm going to take a medicine. But I mean, this is, we've got to fight against this. It's all around us. We've got to seek the higher good. And because it sees no hierarchy in truth, it sees no reason to suffer in the body for a higher truth or higher good. Furthermore, because the new truth tends toward living more in the body than in the rational part of man, it can easily tend towards instability of the mind. A neurosis starts to form. Cognitive dissidence. Once again, nature will bite back. And finally, because modern truth changes and is subject-based, it's relative, all sorts of duplicitous situations develop like passive-aggressive behavior and pitting people against each other which is just a form of Hegelian dialectic in action. So such behavior destroys the virtue of truthfulness and the ability of people to live in a community with some stability and peace. People are always at each other. Natural sciences are now in charge. The hierarchy of the sciences breaks down because they no longer are believed in. There's no more hierarchy. Math and physics and other natural sciences tell us what is true, not theology, not metaphysics. And the motto of the 1933 Chicago Century of Progress World's Fair. That was their motto. Science finds, industry applies, and man conforms. So, for this I was born, the truth. How we understand truth and falsehood affects how we think, what we know, how we perceive the world and the universe. How we behave towards others who our friends are, how we live our lives, and how we die. Until we get back to the properly ordered, God-centered understanding of truth, these trials that we're experiencing in the world will only continue, and sad to say, get worse. Let us then always base all we do, as much as we can, on the traditional understanding of truth. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.